We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with David Kamara of Cape Sierra Capital. David, how are you? How's it going, Casey? Great. Feeling good. Awesome, man. Well, we're glad to have you. And before we get started, the first thing I want to do is, is to remind the listeners to please head down and smash that subscribe button if you like today's content so that uh, you can be notified when we release new episodes and new videos on YouTube and all of that good stuff. And while you're there, if it's after the episode, please leave us a review. Uh, and we ask for kindly for a five-star review so that others may get an idea that we do deliver what we say we're going to deliver on the show. And with that being said, David, I want to again welcome you to the show. And today we're going to be talking about a very, what seems to be a very simple subject to like roll off the tongue and say, but what tends to be a far more, uh, 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 a far deeper subject when it actually comes to it, but how to find real estate investments that cash flow. Now, again, like I said, it, that's an easy topic to say. However, the performance of that is just mildly difficult, right, Dave? <laughs> right. right. Trying to find a, a, a real estate assets that cash flow is just a little bit difficult, especially in the the the, the times that we're in, interest rate environments. And at the very beginning of September when this is being recorded is kind of going to be the timeline. So when we go back, uh, you know, this will air. When this does air, just kind of come back. And if we're talking about something, if something drastic happens in the world, just know we're talking about this about the 1st of September. So, David, I'd like for you to start start by kind of maybe telling us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and then how you got into just even the beginnings of the real estate business. Yeah, thank you, Casey. Uh, great to speak to you listeners. Um, so my my quick story is uh, did college in, in Michigan, I uh, got a job in Chicago, uh, ended up working for an industrial distributor. And while there, I was going to further school and uh, business school and ended up uh, getting into management consulting, which is which is really fun work, very, very challenging. You travel to all these big companies that we hear about in the news, Pepsi, uh, Boeing, companies like that, and try and help them operate better. Um, so it's a, it's a great, great gig, pays well, very very stimulating, but what I ended up uh, falling into is, so my wife and I, we have four kids and I was just on the road a ton. Um, and so sure. after some time that started weighing on us and, and really, uh, you know, missing some, some milestones with the kids, it got us thinking about like, how do we do something different? Um, also in parallel with that, when we first bought our house in, in the suburbs of Chicago, um, my wife and I talked about that and we're very excited. We're like, hey, you can buy a house with, you know, a little bit of money down. So we, we started buying single family houses. And the idea was, you know, we'll buy one a year. And if we if we have time, we we'll buy more. And, you know, in 10 years time, we'll have 10 houses and hopefully a bunch of them get paid off over time. And that would be kind of like the retirement plan. Well, I mean, life happened, you know, 2008 crisis happened. Um we ended up having more kids. We moved from Chicago back to Michigan. Um, we kind of fell off that track a little bit. Um, but again, the consulting work was very, very good and, and good to us financially. Um, at one point, my wife and I got into this conversation about like, okay, how do we get better work-life balance where I don't travel so much? And, and frankly, my, my one of my kids had a conversation with me, asked me a question that stimulated that. Um, and so we look back and said, we have some of these single family investments that work. They're just not substantial. So how do we maybe scale that? Right. And so that was really the beginning of our multifamily journey. 
um, more seriously. Before we had a few duplexes, three, threeplex, and single families, but not not in depth. So that's that's what spurred sure. our our start. And uh, I guess I can pause, and you can follow up. Well, there's there's a lot of intriguing things about. I think I think real quick before we move on with the multifamily, I um, I, you know your your very early your early life from 17 pre prior to being 17 years old i really was intrigued with that and then how you how everything kind of came about there now just share with the audience real quick what i'm kind of talking about because i know yeah, you had yeah. some geographical things that you, and then just I, I again i think that just kind of raises a little intrigue about your story and about how far you really have came since then Sure. So, um, and thanks for, for bringing that up. So my, my, my mom is from Ukraine and my dad is from Sierra Leone, which is West Africa. It's on the Atlantic coast, essentially facing, uh, the U S. Um, my dad was studying in the former Soviet union. That's how my parents met. Um, uh, when he finished his studies, we moved back to Africa. And so I lived in, in Ukraine from, birth essentially till almost eight and then in in sierra leone west africa from eight to basically 17 almost 18. Um, when i finished high school in sierra leone we had a military coup uh, i ended up trying to go to germany ended up in the united states that's another long story but uh when i came i, I came and uh came for college so ended mm -hmm. up going to community college uh in dearborn michigan i was very fortunate and um they had an honors program, which I ended up getting a scholarship in, which allowed me to work and save some money for, for university if I wanted to go to university later. Um, uh, long story short, transferred to University of Michigan, met my wife there, graduated, moved to Chicago, and kind of the rest is, is history. But especially with what's going on sure, in the news today sure. with yeah. Ukraine and all that, it's, it's definitely relevant in that um, I've seen a military coup in Sierra Leone and now a a big upheaval in in Ukraine, which is a little bit upsetting and and frankly um, informs some of what we do and how we do it, and we try to gauge risk and give back where we can sure sure yeah and and I guess the other the other part of that too, and I know there's obviously and I don't want to get too down in the weeds on on world affairs or world politics and stuff like that, but you know with with the world the the world with which your parents your parents' lens that they see through is has got to be one of of a most constant strife really i mean you know basically from the sierra leone you know the diamonds and all of that stuff that 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 maybe that maybe that was a something that was mass known in the country i don't know or if it was something that just you know was was more glorified by hollywood and of course i'm not i don't mean any disrespect if it was i just, no, no, I, no. I just don't know you're straight up you're you're very on point um, the, way to the you're, soviet you're very, i mean well then then the soviet union even i mean the the fact that your parents met in the soviet union right and then the fact that 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 of what's going on with ukraine today i mean it just all of that kind of backstory about yourself really leads me to to say like you know, it really almost makes me just not feel sorry for a lot of people for the very reason that, that you know, you all and your family were in these positions and, you know, and, and what you did was you were like, okay, here's where I am today. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm going to go do what it takes to, to kind of leave this back. And that's, that's, I think to me, the most intriguing part. No, I, I appreciate it, Casey. Um, so, I mean, you know, sometimes we don't pick our lives, right? Things just happen and you're born in a certain place and you're in a certain type of situation. Um, sure. I mean, I have to say that definitely just my, my trajectory through life has, has kind of led me to be very adaptive to situations. Right. And you're always, almost always, yeah. you're, you're looking to see, you know, how can I improve my condition essentially? Right. And I mean, I was very, very fortunate that, I mean, my parents instilled in, in myself, and my sister, just a very strong work ethic. It's, it's always been, you know, you have to be relying on yourself and whether that's school or hard work or, you know, making decisions that 
you know, you're not always going to get them right, but decisions that you know are impacting your life. That's kind of how, how, how that's evolved for us. And I mean, while it's been more adventurous than many, I mean, I wouldn't wish it any other way on myself. Um, and, and definitely that's contributed sure, to who sure. I am and how things have worked out. But again, right, I think circumstance um, leads us all to evolve and grow. And fortunately, that's happened for, for me personally. Sure. Now, the other the other part of this, so so what, leading into my next question, what country were you a citizen of the day you were born? And what are you a full full fledged <laughs> citizen of the United States now? Yeah, so I, I was... Uh, I guess I was a citizen of the Soviet Union when I was born. Um, and then okay. I became a citizen of Ukraine when they became a separate country. Um, I do have the Sierra Leonean citizenship. And then after many years in the United States, I became a United States citizen. So uh, I consider myself awesome. a global citizen. And right, I mean, I, I don't really pay too much heed to, you know, all the nationalistic stuff. But I mean, I think from sure. my personal from my personal exposure, you really find that people all over the, the world are, are very similar, right? Everyone wants to be able to take care of their family. They want to be able to work a little bit, enjoy a little bit. And, and all the yep. religion politics often divides people. But I mean, at, at, at the base of the human condition, we all are very similar. I, rec I realized that whenever we visited Romania a few years back, um, and of course it's, it's, post-communist Romania basically and so but there's still a lot of um there's still a ton of of communism is still painted painted very thick in everything that you see there but from apartment buildings all the way down um to, to old cars that were the only kind of cars that were allowed and so on and so forth but what what intrigued me was I, I I enjoy working out and and what intrigued me was I went into see if you'll notice I get intrigued a lot right um but I went into a gym there and it was there was and the thing is is that there was like 25 people in this gym but women and men both and they were all didn't there was not one single word of english that any of anybody in that entire gym understood not one right um and so basically it took us it took me going in there and just like kind of figuring out what everybody was doing and where, where my spot was going to be. But you know what, at the, at the end of the day, we all enjoyed the same thing. Right. And I was like, and, and it was, and then you even saw that through, 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 I mean, there were so many different things there that I was like, man, these, they're just like us. I mean, they're, they're just like us. They just don't speak English. And it was very eye opening to me that, you know, here I am, however many thousands of miles away from podunk town, Kentucky. And, and all these people just, they just want to do the same things I want to do. They want to hang out. We had some friends there. I know people ask, why'd you go to Romania? We had some friends okay. that were, that were living there. They were living abroad for, uh, he was with a, a company that, that had a barge, uh, holdings over there or whatever. So anyway, all that being said, yeah. And it also, all of that kind of culminates with, with, and I think you are, would be a testament to how great of a country the United States really is simply because of the opportunities that are probably held back, especially from women where, where, where you're from. Um, but probably mostly just to humans in general, opportunities are just held back. They're held out for the elite. They're held out for a uh, government to profit off of. They're held out for many different reasons but at the end of the day, when you start looking at saying, hey, you know, if it hadn't have been for America giving giving David this opportunity um, to be capitalist or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, it's just it's it's a testament to our to our absolutely to the nature of this country. No, that, absolutely. That, that, I think um, I often tell my friends, um, my American born friends, I often tell them that, you know, sometimes they don't realize how how much opportunity this country has, because, you know, you're born here, you kind of you expect certain things when you're born elsewhere yep. and you, you grow up and a lot of those things are absent, you cherish the opportunities so much more and you appreciate them so much more. And again, America is absolutely a testament to how great the country is because if you look around all, all of us immigrants, right. Come here um, where in places we come from, we fight each other and we come here and we all are friends yep. and prosper together. And it's just, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Um, every time 
something else happens. I, I just marvel how great a country this is. Just I just came back from vacation in Italy, and um, actually my mom's passport was stolen, and my mom still has a Ukrainian passport. And so the experience of getting a Ukrainian passport versus getting a U.S. passport back was dramatically different, right? I mean, like you call the U.S. embassy and oh, it's like sure. dial three if you lost a passport, walk in, no appointment necessary. We'll try and get you done same day. Uh, for Ukraine, it was much more difficult than that. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and the country's going through war, so maybe not an not an entirely fair comparison. But there's just so many levels at which um, this is an amazing country. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, my wife and I were in Italy about a few months back, and and I know this. I don't want this again. We're did too far down in the weeds of of world culture and stuff. But but culture is what I enjoy. Uh, the most of anywhere I've ever been. It's just the culture, the the culture stuff. I don't even, you know, people talk about exchange rates and opportunity to this and that and the other, but I just enjoy the culture of, Hey, how do these people break bread together? How do they, you know, right. what's important to them on a, on a, everything from religion to politics to what is important to them? What are, what are life goals of, of whoever I'm with, you know? And so, um, but so now kind of moving towards you getting into the multifamily space and the thousands of units that you all are, are in partners with uh, investors. And then of course, I think you said you had three or 400 doors to yourself that, or that you and your wife owned all by yourselves um, with all of that and, and kind of moving forward, I'd like to bring this whole discussion to today so that we can spend the next little bit of our time talking about what are some ways, when's the last, you know, what are some ways that you're currently finding deals that cash flow? Like, uh, because obviously we, we were going to title this or, or the, the, the main concern with this, with our subject matter here was how to find real estate investments that cash flow. And I guess it's most appropriate probably to talk about that in today's time because it's such a difficult time, but, but let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's what all of us are, are trying to try to figure out, right? Um, I, I think I'd just start by saying the the environment has changed quite a bit. The investment landscape has has definitely changed in the past year, uh, particularly with ri rising interest rates, right, being the primary difference. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a year ago we were looking at you know a deal that you just look at the numbers and you don't have to do too much. Um, creatively to make the deal work and pencil out and you can say yeah this makes sense rents are here expenses and mortgage and all this stuff is here and this probably would make sense to make some money at um i think i think over the past really eight months um we're seeing fewer deals that cash flow right just off the bat and as rates have increased it's been more challenging to get, you know, capital is more expensive, right? So where you would be paying a, yep. you know, a three and a half, four percent interest rate, now you're paying a maybe five, six, seven percent interest rate, sometimes eight if you're doing a floating loan. Mm -hmm. So um, how to how to find deals that cash flow? I mean, it really comes down to relationships at this point for us. Um, so people you have worked with in the past, mainly brokers for us, um, know that we have closed or we have performed in certain deals. Um, but also really being creative, right? Some people swear by doing direct mail campaigns to owners and trying to reach owners that way to um, explore if owners are interested in selling, right? Um, we have not done that uh, as a process. We've relied mostly on broker relationships and introductions, um, but we, we're very willing to look at all opportunities, right? So we're we're small enough or we're flexible enough. We're not stuffy that, you know, oh, this process doesn't work for us. We, we're very willing to meet sellers where they are, right? And um, mm -hmm. we do a lot of investments in Michigan. There's a there's a seller that, you know, is a very private individual. And he's like, hey, I don't want to share my my information. How about we meet up for lunch, right? And so yep. here I am going to lunch with a seller, you know, just to make a human connection and see what is it that they need? What are they, I mean, are they, where are they? Like really just to learn, right? Maybe it's not a deal today. Maybe it's a deal in, in 10 months or 18 months, who knows? Yeah. So you really have to maintain a very, I would say, open approach. And, and um, I mean, one deal that we closed earlier this year, we closed on that deal, I think in March, took us about, I would say 14 months to close. 
right? It was a, wow. it was a long, it was a long conversation. Well, it took, it took 14 months to get the seller to say, okay, I'm willing to close. It was a long conversation with the seller. We met him, um, early last year and we bought another property in their market and we, the broker actually introduced us and said, Hey, this gentleman here has this other property, but they're not ready yet. Right. So it was just maintaining contact, speaking with them, visiting them, understanding, you know, what would make them sell. Right. And at some level, sure. It was a price, but at some level it was just, you know, where were they in their life? Like this gentleman was older, he right. wasn't quite ready to retire. He was going through a surgery. Then he was kind of ready to retire and take everything. Um, so it's it's really being flexible and entertain different avenues of where deals may come from, right? Brokers is one. Um, your local uh, non-commercial realtors could be one as well. We bought deals from the MLS that we found which, sure. you know, you normally, you normally don't look there, um, but that's, yep. that's a channel. Some people, you know, your mom and pop owners that have a property that they, the first thing they turn to is their local realtor and say, Hey, I have a property for sale. They don't think it's, you know, 12 to 20 units. They think who sells property locally. And that's the guy I know that's the guy I trust. So it's really about being yep. open, creative, um, different people do different things. Some people shop at the foreclosure auctions. I think there've been a few of those with, with COVID, but again, Multifamily has been really solid. So you kind of pick and see what works for you. What do you like doing, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to be unnatural to yourself. You want to do things that, you know, you find interesting and enjoy doing and hopefully are good at because you enjoy doing them. Um, that way it feels less yep. like a job. It's more of, you know, it's a fun experience and you get good at it. Well, you know, we, we hit a lot on relationships on this, on this podcast. And I, and I got to say that, you know, whether you're raising money or whether you're looking for properties that cash flow, I mean, those relationships, I mean, and even if they come down to, to you, you, if you're running a 506 C where you need accredited investors and you can advertise, you still have to build some type of relationship because there's not, I mean, in some cases, there's obviously people out there who are saying, Hey, here's my hundred thousand dollars. Take it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But there's, there's very few out there that do that without needing on some level, some feeling of comfort Absolutely. to say, Hey, you know, we, we feel comfortable with this guy, David, here's a hundred grand for you to take and, and invest and, and we, we expect a return and we expect not only a return, but the return of our capital. And so, you know, when you, when you, when you come down to that, and that's what we talk a lot about in my mastermind as well is, is a matter of fact, one guy, um, one guy says that the return of capital is more important than the return on capital and the return of capital basically is the, is the, is the fruit that you've harvested from that relationship right. and allows you to continue. And then it, obviously, because it seems like everybody understands at times real estate assets don't perform the way they're supposed to, or we had a fire or we had some other calamity of something that happened that, that caused this to not perform like we anticipated but if you call a guy and you're like, Hey man, thank you for that hundred thousand dollars. And I only have 25 to give back to you, but here it is. That's not going to go over very good. But if you call a guy and you're like, Hey, listen, I was able to rescue you. And, and I saved here, here's the return of your capital. Um, I'm sorry. We didn't, we only made two or 3%. You know, that's a heck of a lot easier to discuss than, than, Hey man, here, I lost your money. So yeah, yeah no, it all comes down to those relationships and, I think, I think everybody envisions the relationship where, um, or fears, I guess, more the, 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 the first scenario there where, Hey, thanks for that hundred thousand dollars. By the way, I'm only going to give you 25 back. Cause we lost the other, um, I think everybody fears that everybody envisions the, the worst case scenario of something like that happening. Um, then others are just saying, you know, so anyway, it all comes down to the relationships, but then, like you said, I think a lot of times the relation, the broker relationship or the, 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 the deal finder relationship that you have gets a little bit slept on, uh, because you're focused on raising money or you're in and not focusing like you should on finding the deals. But anyway, it's all, and then, every, and then, there, then there's always that chicken or the egg scenario comes. Do you need to build investor relationships first, or do you need to build broker relationships first? And, 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 and our my response to that question is always both, you know, you just need to be, you need to be actively trying to do both. So, right. um, yeah, well, David, man, I mean, you know, sorry, go ahead. sorry. I was just going to say the way that it happened for us was, um, we, 
we were ready to do some deals and we had we had some some capital that you know we were not in question about whether we will or will not use and so then the broker relationships are a bit easier right if if a broker knows you're ready then yep. they kind of first they'll try to you know weed you out and see if you're really serious but once once you once they see that you're you're for real like that 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 part's easy um on the on the cash uh capital raising side um i think you really have to be again take a step back and not try to not try to sell too much right because it's a very fine balance yep. right um you don't want to sell anybody anything right you're really just talking about what is the opportunity um but you you have to be yep. you have to be very sincere about it because i mean this is somebody's real cash that they have earned through hard work and sweat right and and yep. i mean for anybody who's trying to make a business out of this it's a very much a reputation business right so like you were mentioning if yep. if you don't return someone's money to them right i mean that 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 becomes known very quickly right it's a very small community yeah. it's a very it's a very yeah. small world and i mean we when we started like we didn't want to take people's money for that reason. And then finally, like a lot of people were asking the same question. So like, okay, we'll do it. We'll be very, very careful. We'll have ample reserves and we'll make sure that frankly, if push came to shove, we'll lose our money and investors money would be fine. Because again, we just want to make sure that the reputation was sound. And hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. I mean, all of the people that invest with us, I know personally, or on some have a some some personal relationship with, um, and so, I mean, in many cases, these are people that you know my kids go to school with, or people that I used to work with, and and so, I know I have to look them in the eye sometime, right? If I lost their cash, and so, I guess what that creates for us is we're extremely careful about what we invest in. And especially in this type of uh, environment right now where cash flowing deals are a bit more difficult to find, I guess my recommendation is be very careful, um, swing fewer times. And in relation to how many times you swing, it's fine to to miss many, right? When you go and in- And I wanna point out real quick before you move too far past yeah. that, where you're talking about you have a personal relationship with everybody that invests in your deals. And I, I'm, I'm famously known among my podcast guests as being the guy that always says all capital is not created equal. Right. And the thing is, is that I'm not saying don't take an investment from somebody that you don't necessarily know, like, no, no, like would go eat dinner with or something like that. I'm saying make sure that you ask the right questions Absolutely. and Absolutely. build at least enough rapport to know how big of a burr in the side is this guy or lady going to be, right? How are they going to come into this deal and then all of a sudden going to want some slice of the control? Because again, it's not necessarily keeping people from being in control. It's keeping one goal set in mind, one business plan in place and moving forward instead of ideas from everybody that you're always trying to listen to. And so I, I just, before you moved past that, I wanted to just point out that yes, those relationships are equally as important on who you accept capital from. Absolutely. Not just whether they have it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you, so for so, us, a couple of things on that, right. You couldn't be more, more right. And it's, it's a point that needs underlining. Um, you want to have very clear and blunt conversations with your investors, right? About yes. expectations and about what their capability is, right? You don't want somebody investing in your syndication where it's their bottom dollar, right? And this is their make or break. Like that, this is not that kind of an investment. 
And frankly, yeah, it's their grocery of, money. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of burden for anybody to take on, right? So, I mean, whether it's a buddy that you grew up with from from elementary school, or it's somebody who you know heard you on a podcast and reached out and said, "Hey, I heard you on your podcast, and you know, I really related to your story, and I feel like yep. I almost know you already." Right? That happens, which is very humbling when that happens. But you want to take it a step further and meet with that person for a considerable period of time. Ask them all the important questions about, you know, what's their financial situation? When do they need what money back? Because real estate investing is an illiquid investment, right? So once they write you that check and you go and you take and buy that building, it's not something you can turn around on a dime and say, oh, I want to cash out. Like, it's not the stock market, right? Yeah. Um, so, so you need yeah. to have that conversation and that expectation setting with them. And And frankly, then the last point is there are people that, even if they check all those boxes where they, you know, they're accredited or they have sufficient other wealth that this is not a significant portion of their wealth. Just from a personality perspective, you want to make sure that you can service them at a level that they want to be serviced. Some people yeah. have, a f have a lot more questions than other people, right? And some people have a degree of comfort that comes much easier than, than other people. And that's just personalities, right? So you want to make those decisions as well. Um, based on how you are set up, right? So um, yep. we take that into consideration and we have a very honest conversation. Like this is this, these are the expectations of our communication. For us, anybody that writes us a check, I feel deserves a lot of answers, right? Yep. Um, so we make it a point to be available, um, meet as many times as they want up front to make them comfortable. Um, but once the deal is in progress, right? Again, you have to make the expectation be very clear. They are the limited partner, quote, limited for a reason they don't they get limited control that's, that's how right. that's how the syndications are set up you are the general partner you have the managerial control you also have the, the liability right more liability that's than right. the limiteds the limiteds don't have really any litigation exposure because it's like if you bought google stock no one's going to sue you for what google does right, that's right. Um, but if you're a director of google yeah you probably have something to do with how google runs yep yep Awesome, man. Great discussion. Um, the fact that you just got back from Italy um, kind of paralyzes one of the questions that we ask at the end of the show. But anyway, we're going to start with the first question that we ask everybody that comes on the show is, what is the best book that you've recently read or are currently reading? Best book? Um, there are a lot. Um, so I'll give maybe two, if I might. Um, I really sure. like I really like the book. It's called The Perfect Investment. It's by Paul Moore. Um, and he talks about real estate. So he is a gentleman actually from this area of Michigan. Um, worked at Ford. Yeah, I know Paul. I know Paul. Worked at Ford, did a bunch of things, invested in businesses, and actually had a podcast called yeah. How to Lose Money. <laughs> um, yeah, and he, I know he, Paul. <laughs> he, concluded, he concluded that, you know, here's why he likes real estate. That book is is very well written. It's it's not super lengthy. Uh -huh. Love it. That That's a great book. Um, another book that I really like, um, and this is really not necessarily real estate per se, but uh, The 4-Hour Workweek. Um, it's a very interesting book about, you know, puts a lot of things in perspective about how you can liberate your time. I don't know that I, I don't know that I've gotten to four hours of working, but definitely gives you some tips on how you can work less and be a bit more productive in your life. Um, and it's got lots of really yeah. good resources. And I think it's just one of those books that when you read it, changes your perspective on a lot of things. Not that you will go jump to working four hours a week, but definitely ask some questions that are, that are interesting and I'm sure will be different for everyone who reads it. Sure. Yeah. All right. Next question. What is a dream vacation that you've taken or hope to take? And maybe I guess uh, the, the last one you took was one that you've taken, but what is a dream vacation you've taken or hope to take? Um, so I was fortunate. So we just came from three weeks in Italy. My, my sister actually was getting married. Um, and so it was, it was an amazing oh, okay. trip. It was an amazing trip. We left basically two and a half weeks early, uh, took the whole family, um, visited everything, Sardinia, then Sicily, then drove up slowly up the coast. Uh, it was, was an amazing time. Oh, um, yes. Ha had some further excitement in that our car got broken into. I think I just alluded to that. 
um, and some passports were taken, but we were able to figure all that out and uh, made for even more more fun adventure that we'll never forget. Um, great country, great food. Sure. Somehow, we ate, somehow we ate gelato, pizza, and pasta every day, and we managed to like drop a few pounds too. So I don't know where. <laughs> um, yeah, every day. That's I blame I blame a lot of what I got going on here in the front from Italy, from my trip to Italy and all of the like. It's one of those things where I I wanted to try the carbonara everywhere I went, and everybody's was different. Yeah, no, and I think I think future vacations, my my kids want to go to Japan and Australia. We haven't done either of those yes. countries, but we look forward to doing those in the future at some point. And then uh, we really enjoy Hawaii. Hawaii is just very beautiful. All the islands, um, you can find something for everyone there, and it's it's just a beautiful place. So we love Hawaii. Sure, sure, awesome, awesome. Well, good, David. Little listen. How can the listeners uh, reach out and get in touch with you if there's something they heard that that, that resonated with them and they'd like to to learn more about you or learn more about uh, Cape Sierra Capital or anything like that, how can they reach out and get in touch with you? Sure. Um, best way is our website. So our website is capesierracapital.com. That's C-A-P-E-S-I-E-R-R-A capital.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check out our free ebook, which is the personal cash flow formula. And that's at Cape Sierra Capital slash cash flow. Um, and my contacts there, I mean, you could email me, feel free to reach out in any way possible. I'm very accessible. Um, I feel like this space is not well known or not known enough. And I, I'm very happy to share any any knowledge I have in multifamily. Awesome. Awesome. We certainly do appreciate that. I know the listeners appreciate that, especially if uh, one reaches out to get in touch with you. Uh, I know that you can drop a ton of value because, I mean, you bring, a, you bring such a... Um, uh, uh, just a mass amount of, of different life experiences. And again, it all kind of comes back and fo- focuses on finding investments that cash flow, finding real estate investments that cash flow, and finding things that work for you and your business model and business plan. All right, which brings us to the end of the show. And as always, please, if you like today's episode, head down and leave us a review. We hope it's a five star review and also type out a review so that others can know what we talk about here on the Cashflow Pro. And while you're there, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. And David, I can't thank you enough. I know you're just getting back from a from a long from three weeks in Italy. I can imagine there's some cobwebs up there and and what that some toothpicks need to hold the eyes open. I mean, I'm sure it's all of that stuff. Well, just lagged so, a bit. Um, thank you so much, Casey. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. We appreciate you being with us today, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.